Oh, hello. My name is uh, Jimmy Carr, and uh, this week I'm hosting Blocks, the podcast that was my idea. Um, and Neil gives me props for every single week because he's a mensch. Uh, Neil Brennan is one of the finest comedy minds working. If you're not familiar with Three Mics and Blocks, I suggest you pause this now. Go and watch those. Okay, you're back. They were funny, weren't they? Uh, really funny, really open emotionally. Uh, Let's and- talk about the structure. Yeah, well, structurally interesting, structurally very interesting. But the blocks uh, show you share a lot. Three mics, you share an awful lot of yourself. I thought it would be fun for the listeners of blocks to do a special episode with you. We talk about your blocks, we update your blocks, we talk about the things going on in your life um, because you are, uh, I think, at the vanguard of uh, human existence. Human behavior. Uh, where where tragedy meets comedy. I mean, <laughs> your childhood. I would say. I know we're both obsessed by. Um, documentaries. Your childhood, it strikes me, would be a hit documentary on Netflix and people would not believe it. If they had filmed it, your childhood, I don't think people would believe how difficult it was. And I don't think you fully acknowledge that. Sometimes when I, I talk don't, to you about Somebody your said recently, you've experienced as much sadness as any, or hardship as anyone I know. And I was like, I don't think I, cause you no, just- Genuinely, I was thinking about it recently cause I watched the, uh, the beginning of that, uh, it was like a cult documentary. Mm-hmm. And I went, oh, Neil was had a worse childhood than that. So talk us through the, it gives the beats for anyone that hasn't seen it, the beats of your childhood. Childhood father was a violent alcoholic. Um, he would drink. That's already a movie. Yeah. Uh, this, this Boy's this, Life. This Boy's Life, yes. Yeah. That's kind of the main thing. Like my father was violent. And at that point, you're all, you don't know where the violence is coming from, why, how often, and it creates kind of well, a state of Well, there's a whole thing in psychotherapy about where you were born. Like, I'm, I'm a middle kid, so my uh, mother had all the anxiety around the first kid, and then the second kid, she was able to be more relaxed, and you feel that you're, you're more relaxed as the yeah. second kid, right? Um, you were born where in the sequence? Tenth. Yeah, they don't have a theory on that, because there's not enough of them. There's no theory. Yeah. There's no yes. book about, well, if you're the tenth kid, you'll be Neil Brennan. My mother was That's in, it. My mother was in labor for 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Uh-huh. I mean, literally walked out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, she looked over and I was walking next to her. Yeah. Is, is, is with an umbilical cord. So, no love from your father. Dad, none. Admitted, self admitted, I did not love you. And on his deathbed. Which part of the deathbed took, left, uh, wrote me out of his will? Wrote, yeah. Disinherited. Yeah. And it consciously, no, mm-hmm. I hadn't lost his mind, consciously mm-hmm. disinherited mm-hmm. and told you that he didn't love yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty heartbreaking. To be your friend sometimes because you you ha- I can feel my, I'm like tearing up it's it's awful it's just awful and then I look at your relationship with your mother and the I'm privy to a lot of the list of rules which you you sort of name check in yeah blocks. I name a few of them bunch of TV rules like a lot of laundry rules a lot of sandwich rules you guys probably all had sandwich rules right <laughs> I'm so obsessed by that. You had a list of rules that were put up by your mother that are, again, heartbreak upon heartbreak, like the food, the laundry, the, the rules, the lack of... Warmth. No She warmth was weirdly that. warm in, a, in her own way. And in her defense, she did stuff that was like incredibly thoughtful. Like Every night, she would warm the plates up for dinner. Right. She made dinner, warmed the plates up. We all have warm... It's like a nice, thoughtful thing to do. For instance, I, and I, I'm more, I just spent some time with my mom. Just, there's a straw there. Oh, I, I can, I can almost reach the, the warm place. I mean, no love in your childhood in any, in any way that anyone else would understand. No, no, no warm, real empathy. Yeah. But a warm plate. So that's something. Eh? If you're thinking about having kids, not as tough as you thought. Warmer plate, that'll do. I mean, it really feels like that's. I could say the same about yours, buddy. For real. Uh, yeah, but uh, let's. Uh, well, well, no, I get it. But I'm just saying, like, that's why I don't have a ton of. You've got no self pity, which is remarkable. B- and also a giant amount of self pity. Like, there, I spent a lot of time feeling sorry for myself in my life. And then at a certain point, I had a story in Blocks that you told me to cut. And I didn't for a while. And then I did when I taped it because I was like, I don't, I can't keep harping on this. Um, it was a story about shitting my pants, like either disobeying my father or shitting my pants. And I chose to, you guessed it, shit my pants. 
the self pity pool in my in my spirit kind of went. I just stopped two three years ago. I think we talked about this because J.K. Rowling had a great line on it, which is it's tough love at its toughest. Where you go, we have to have a statute of limitations on childhood grievances. I don't know what age it is because it's definitely not eighteen. If someone comes to you at eighteen and yep. says, "I had that childhood," you go. Oh man, you okay? You need a hug. You okay? If someone comes to you at twenty-five and says, "I had a really tough childhood," but you can't be meeting St. Peter at the gates, going, "My dad." Did you was, see? Yeah, my dad was a dick. Yeah, yeah. but you had forty years. You come on. You, you, yeah, you have to get. That's past about that the calculation stage. for me. Is at, at, at around late forties, I was like, "I guess up. I, I got to just stop doing this because I don't." A lot of that before that was a lot of anger at my yeah. dad and my mom and I like I was happy to talk about it. in fact three mics was written as a the dad part was written for revenge and at a certain point I was like Duh, can I give him I don't want to just go slag him on stage so I made it more I put I put some empathy in it of like what did yeah. I owe him and what was his life like yes I mean his life was I mean he grew up in the depression who who even knows but I think you want to correct that as a parent I would agree. Yeah. I mean, I, you're, uh, what's your line in blocks? Both my parents were born during the Great Depression, and they were nice enough to bring it with them. <laughs> uh, that was the Derek Delgadio line, the director. Yeah. And uh, Again, great your line. obsession with fairness. It's a line in your special. It's a great line. You give the credit to the guy that gave you the line. It's like- Re the, Do you remember what every... I used to do for a living? Yeah. But it's, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting, that thing of like your- the, the, the grievances, which is your first big block, um, holding, I mean, I thought the next special, if you just did, you could call it grudge match and it's just all of the things where it's the other great line in blocks where you go, I gotta be the only person who was ever asked the question, Neil, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? And I was like, oh, <laughs> and knowing you, I go, well, that's bullshit. You'd rather be right. <laughs> I mean, like the idea, like you're bullshitting the audience, like, oh, it was a tough decision for me. I bet that would have gotten the same amount of laughs. Yeah. You'd rather be right or you'd rather be happy. Right. Uh, right. Let's move, yeah, that would have gotten right. Let's move on. Let's move uh, on. And also, that's the right answer. So, and I can tell you why. <laughs> so the grudge is the, you've fallen out with a lot of people over the years. And um, I think it's a, I feel very privileged to be your friend. There's an extra level you get to going, no one's better at friendship. Like you're really good at being honest and direct and respectful and you you add a lot of value. I think uh, when I first met you, I was very kind of drawn to that kind of your mind in comedy. You 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 help a lot, but also it, you're very giving of you know lines and ideas and things. But it's also that thing if you go, you're very good at being honest. You're very good at, you know, it's a, I think friendship- It comes from a, I think it's in a weird way comes from a bad place. I mean, eh. I remember yelling at somebody and I was like, look, I'm not trying to draw blood here. And, and then I, bought, I took a beat and I was like, you know what? I grew up Catholic and the truth is I am trying to draw a little bit of blood, like real uh, righteousness. And, and, and so that's a downside. But I think it, it, if I apply it correctly, it can be helpful to the person. Yeah. So that thing of the, the resentment and the being willing to break up with friends is a very unusual thing. Most people, they, they talk, they'll talk about ending relationships, but there's very few people that have talked about it. I thought it might be an interesting bit of stand-up for one of us about ending relationships with friends. We go, you're no longer, you know, I essentially, I suppose I broke up. My father's not dead, but I haven't seen my father in many years and I don't intend to. But that like breaking up emotionally with someone and going, yeah, I don't need that in my life. Is, yeah, it would, strikes me as quite healthy in a way. They, I know, and I'm on the fence about it. Meaning, I like having boundaries. It ha the lack of boundaries in my life was really damaging and painful. And then you go to twelve step groups and you learn some boundaries. Now I, 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 and I, I had them, and and I never really administered them until the last couple years, and. And I still don't know if I'm right about it. That's the interesting thing is like, if I, if I say I don't want to be friends with you anymore, uh, I, it's always after a lot of consideration and a lot of friendship. And if they haven't, I think the, the main element of friendship is reciprocation. Yeah. It's, it's, I go to your party, you come to my party. 
I call you back within a day, you call me back within a day. It's just, it has to be yes, fair. I, I do feel that thing of like some, some friends that you feel like you're chasing and you kind of go, I, do I, sorry, why, what am I doing here? What's, what's yeah, going on? I'm an adult. I mean, Sometimes if, it, if it's not, if it doesn't feel equal, it, you can't go ahead. That's what friendships are. That seems to be the point of friendship. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, it seems- I feel like there's a, I, my theory is, I think comedians have career dysmorphia. Oh, we all do. And we think, oh, my career is, because I'm not doing as, or as, you know, yeah. wherever we stand, wherever we are in the hierarchy at the comedy store or the cellar or theaters or how many we're selling or how many nights we're doing at the Beacon, whatever the, whatever the metric is, there'll always be someone doing better and someone doing worse and where do you stand? Yeah. But actually, if you step back just for a second and go, well, that's all crazy, you're all making a living telling jokes. This is all great. The, the, it's what I've come to is comparison is the thief of joy, right? Unless you compare down. Compare down. That's what I've been doing recently. I just go, ah, and then I go, but... I'm doing yeah. incredibly well, but because you're in the, you know, it's like you watch a marathon and there's like the group of, yeah, yeah. let's face it, Kenyans at the front. And then they all, they're just, but it's like, dude, you guys are dominating relative to the field, but yes. you're only looking at the nine people in your pack or whatever. I always feel terrible for tennis players. How come? Because the number three player in the world turns up. Any, anywhere he goes, the one and two are there. They yeah, are fucking you guys. Yeah, like you could have gone anywhere else in the world. I think the great yeah. thing about being a touring comic, especially when you play unusual places, I mean, no I'm, one's there. No one's there. Yeah, no one's there. If you're in, if if you're in, um, if you're in Reykjavik, no one's been there for months. <laughs> I know. Oh, I remember you're here. Great. David Tell said it was great. He was in Alaska, and it was like it was the great feeling to be the funniest person within a thousand miles. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think David Tell could say that most nights in New York, but I, he can say it most places in the, any uh, any place in the world. But yeah, he's incredible. He's um, absolutely incredible. That thing of fairness, though, do you think that comes from your childhood and the injustice of growing up the youngest of ten and it's yes. having nothing? I mean, your parents weren't poor, but they, they had so many children. They and everyone's they poor at that yeah. amount of kids. Yes, I think even Elon Musk is going. Eh, what are we going to do? For I the got eleven, feed? but for, yeah. Uh, you told me that good Elon Musk story about the house. I'm sure you can't repeat it. Oh, no, I could repeat that story. Yeah. yeah. Where he was renting a house. Tiny, yeah. A, a his friend came around. He was holding two babies. Elon Musk is in a small house holding two babies. A tiny house down the road from the factory holding two babies. And the friend knocks on the door and goes, what? You, know, I came to the, you, you, live, you live here? Yeah. Doesn't own anything. Doesn't own anything anymore. Got rid of all the houses. Yeah. Just because it wasn't getting him closer to where he wanted to be. And he didn't like how expensive houses were. Yeah. There were the interest, it, it, the real estate in Austin had gone up so much that he's like, I'm not fucking paying those prices. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, fine. If you're fine. cheap, you're cheap. Crazy. Yeah, it, here's what it is. I believe because violence can come from anywhere uh, when I'm a kid. Yeah. It all, every time, you know, that like post game thing, I don't know if you relate to it when you're a kid and you're alone in your room and you're crying and you're just like, oh. mine was always like, this is so unfair. Warn me. Let, me. let me do something horrible, then beat me up. Instead of, and I, again, I got the least of my family, so I'm like, you know, it's it's a handful of incidents. But the fear of it is it can come at any time at anyone. Well, also seeing that, being exposed to that as a child, you even, you don't really acknowledge, I don't feel, uh, as a trauma. You you acknowledge when it happened to you, but you don't acknowledge your first memory. Yeah, my first memory is my brother fighting my dad. Yeah. So I do see it as a trauma, uh, but I don't, I think the lingering one is anything bad can happen at any point for no reason. So if I can create a fair environment, then I'm pleased and I can count on behavior and expectations and all that stuff. And so if I don't have that, I hate it. And, or it's what I didn't like about most of the relationships I was in romantically is like, Wait, what? You can just yell at me for a thing you're making up? And, you know, uh, the woman I'm with now pitched, like, well, can't you empathize with me for feeling that way? And I was like, I can't. And she was like, you're right. And that was like the first time I, I was like, this, could, this is new and it, this could work forever. Yeah. To me. 
Yes, um, an, an emotional kind of match. Fairness. Yeah, like an emotional, like, oh, because you brought it up. Like, you can't just hold on to the grievance. If I, pr if I say things to you that show you that you were wrong, logically, hmm. I have to, you have to agree. Well, I think that thing about your... Um, you know, you can't tell me how to feel or, you know, but becomes um, a very tough way to be in the world because it's, you're not living in other people's worlds, they're living in yours. And that's a very you, difficult to form relationships with that. But I think that's what everyone does. I think you come, I think the ideal relationship is, and we've just found it hmm. at naturally, is fairness, expectations, uh, reciprocation, but, you know, like, and you I can remember you, build... I remember when we first became friends, went on a long walk and oh, a couple of long walks in Montreal. And you said to me at the end of it, you said, okay, so we're going to be friends. And uh, when we're in the same city, we're going to have lunch and hang. Yeah. Pretty much it. That's the, that's okay? the, those and are the terms. you gave me a hug and you said goodbye. Yep. And it was, I'd never had anyone set down the rubric of a friendship <laughs> and how this is going to work. And it went, okay. And that's what we do. We're in the same city. We hang out and we have lunch and we talk and that and then we're sometimes we're in our lives a lot, sometimes not. But it, you know, it really works as a as a thing. Yeah. I think you can ask up front what you believe it will be. Yeah. Or I guess well, I, I I mean my theory on happiness is its expectations exceeded. It's like that why is why is why are birthdays terrible and New Year's is shitty? It's because the expectation is this is gonna be the best night. Can't be met. You yeah. can't meet those expectations. And you go, Well, it's just gonna be okay. Yeah. It's if you go, fun. okay, I have a question. I don't like parties. Yeah. <laughs> so how are we going to handle this? Yeah. Um, yeah. It seems like that's now someone would say like, you're Neil, you're so autistic for saying that. But I'm like, I get my feelings hurt all the time by friendship. So if I say, hey, can you do this? Yeah. And you go, yeah. Okay. Then there's no, then everything we can resolve conflict easily. We can, it just makes everything. And the question is, is that, valuable enough. I don't know. If, I don't know if I've resolved the conflict with you specifically where you've been wrong. I've been wrong a couple of times. Oh, uh, we haven't had I, a thing. We haven't had a thing where you've been wrong. But that's maybe... But I just talked about not complimenting you enough. Oh, but I mean, that's <laughs> hardly... I don't think that's a foul. I sent you, uh, for context here, it's another podcast, but uh, I sent Neil my uh, special and he was very effusive and nice about the jokes, but didn't compliment the direction. I mean, honestly, he had directed it. Honestly, I got, I was asking you to do me a favor. That's, I'm not looking for praise. I'm saying you watch it. Is it okay? Like I was oh, getting yeah. you to watch it as the slightly the professor of stand up and going to go, okay, that's good. Or that's a bit like that or whatever. Or yeah, that's yeah, too yeah. similar to the bit on the previous yeah. one, whatever the thing would be that you go. Sometimes you have a blind spot. And I gave you that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. It's great. You just go, it's great. Is, is kind of enough. But it's that thing of like where that comes from. I know what that means from you. Yeah. You've heard me give opinions about other specials that you probably agreed with. Yes. I mean, I think you had uh, that Montreal, that thing that you wrote in Montreal, which I think should be a bit stand up. Oh, I gave a speech. They ha they did not videotape it. So pretty great. Did they not? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. But it was a speech about like, it was kind of a, like State of the Union of comedy. And some of the beats from that, I think would be great. In, like people listen to po comedy podcasts because they're super into it. Yeah. Some of the beats of that were great of like, how lucky are we? How grateful should we be for our lives? Like how few people can do this? Yeah. Jim Jeffries was here last week and we talked about how you told him yeah. like we're, there are how many great stand-up comedians in the world? That's, those are astronaut numbers. Yeah. Like there's 60, I don't know how many comedians you think are great. A hundred. Even What are there a hundred of on earth? It's yeah. like a very... But your thing, in the, your thing in Montreal was like there are 60,000 brain surgeons. Yeah. You meet brain surgeons, pretty impressive. But uh, a brain surgeon meeting a stand-up comedian should be, please. Should jerk him this off. Is, this is unusual. Or yeah. her off, whatever your, yeah. whatever um, your thing is. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Each HelloFresh box is packed with farm fresh ingredients and everything arrives pre-proportioned right to your doorstep for less hassle and less wasted food. Ditch the meal planning blues and the grocery store run with quick, convenient recipes delivered right to you. Just choose your meals and select your delivery date. HelloFresh handles the meal planning and shopping. So all you have to do is open your weekly box of fresh pre-proportioned ingredients and step-by-step -step recipes to get cooking. Guys, I did it. 
they sent me meat, which you know I don't eat, but I gave it to my neighbor. I actually know my neighbor is a pretty great person. And the meat looked, I don't like meat, but it looked like the, I liked the way it was packed. It looked like good meat. I believe it was pork. Like it was frozen. Everything's frozen and good. There were like beans. I kept the beans. They were delicious. I cooked them. They give you a card with a recipe. The whole thing works. I get it. I get the appeal. They gave me pasta. It was great. It was great to have stuff in my house that I was just like, oh, I can eat this. And maybe it wasn't vegan, but I don't. Whatever. Don't most people aren't vegan. Don't, don't you don't have to obey my lifestyle. But it was just good to have stuff in the fridge. It took very little. I think it probably took ten minutes to make uh, the beans and the and the pasta, and it was good. Also, I'm not a big breakfast person, but people love breakfast. And here's the new deal: go to HelloFresh.com/slash Neil Free N E A L F R E E and use code N E A L F R E E for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash N-E-A-L-F-R-E-E with code N-E-A-L-F-R-E-E. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Okay, fast forward to the end of 2024. Who do you want to have been at the end of 2024? Think of your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of feeling good about yourself, being a person that sets goals and achieves them? If you want to learn a new language, you absolutely should get Babbel. This year, I've gone to Mexico twice, and then a couple weeks ago, I went to Barcelona to meet my lady. My Babbel practice, it paid off in Barcelona. Barcelona. To me, I've said this before, you want to just not feel defenseless when you're in situations, right? If I'm in a store and I want to know how much something is, I don't just sort of sheepishly, like, Argh. I can actually say, cuanto cuesta esto. And they know what I'm asking, which is how much this cost. So it's stuff like that that helps from Babbel. Babbel is conversation-based learning built with science-backed cognitive tools like spaced repetition and interactive lessons created by real language teachers and voiced by real native speakers. Babbel's advanced speech recognition is like having your own personal language coach to help improve your pronunciation to get you prepped and confident for real-world conversations. Here's a special deal for my listeners. Right now, get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash B-L-O-C-K-S. Get 55% off at Babbel dot com slash B-L-O-C-K-S, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash B-L-O-C-K-S. Rules and restrictions may apply. Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash B-L-O-C-K-S. You got this. The lack of appreciation is interesting. What are you going to need to see from the world that you go, I made it? Because I slightly think it should happen earlier in people in comedy careers. I think as soon as you're playing sets and you're getting paid money to play the clubs around the country. You should be grateful and you, everything else is gravy. We are doing the same yeah. job. Everything else is gravy. So the people at the store, they should go, well, I'm... We talk to other comics in exactly the same way. Like if I give someone a tag for a line, if a fairly new comic comes to see my show, gives me a tag, great. It's okay. The, I, I basically I wrote new blocks that I didn't talk about in, in the Netflix. First one was grievance. We talked about that. And now we're talking about my lack of appreciation. You mentioned it when you sat here a few hours ago that it doesn't read when you get a special or get a big check or you do a thing, you don't, it doesn't read like th you're thrilled because you have a, such a measured personality. Yeah. Not only have a measured personality, me, I, my point is I know how extraordinary my life is and I know how, for lack of a better word, talented or successful I am. I don't often really appreciate it. Because life is so busy and there's always, you know, we're always looking up or we're looking down. We never look out. We never look out and survey the land. And that's the thing I have a hard time with where my friend David Kabuka came to see the new special and was like, now that's the, he's, uh, I think he's Nigerian. He was like, now that's the Neil Brennan we've all been waiting for. He's like, you, you like, he's he actually said, he was like, you don't give a shit about anyone. <laughs> you just like, yeah, was, and I don't even think that that's the, what the special's like, but he was more just like appreciate. He always was like, when I think of you, I think of you as like directing LeBron or doing a Netflix special. And I'm walking around like mopey, even on the specials. This one, I'm not mopey. 
I I wish I could take I don't even think it's self esteem. I think it's the minute to minute feeling of being lucky or being because it's not even successful. It's more it's it's luck. I mean to live it, in this yes. era where comedy is respected in this way. If we've grown up in the nineteen thirties, it's it's not anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's that thing if you go it's not it's and it's always like that. The the illusions, the lies in comedy. It's always it's talent and it's hard work. Yeah, and it's always a mix of the two. You know, you have a, yeah. a, a natural kind of you know, maybe you have got predilection for thinking in this way, and then you put the work in. But without the work, you nothing. Yeah, and I even say I I don't feel this, but I do say you're lucky to have a work ethic. Yeah, well, it's a weird thing where we will sort of if a beautiful woman walks into a place like a model. It's easy for her. She's good looking. But I was chatting to a girl. It's like an IQ of 180. Mm -hmm. What the, the fuck are you talking about? She's beautiful. You're really clever. And you were born with a huge IQ and you have a weird work ethic where you read everything. And you go, well, yeah, that's... That is a form of... Like, you're, you luck, don't but dictate... We don't see that luck in the same way. Luck seems yeah. to be the thing that we really see and it rankles that people go, oh, that's just really lucky. He's that good looking. She's that good looking. That's just a, a luck thing. But also, it's like, looks expire. Yeah. And that's, and our talents won't expire, ideally. I mean, they'll maybe popularity will, will wane or go up or whatever. But, but I, I think it's all luck. What would make it feel like you were acknowledging that success? So when the new special drops, what could you do that would be like you could buy yourself something or go somewhere? I or, had it or, when blogs came out. I was literally walking down the street. There's a, uh, there's like Austin downtown, and if you cross the river, it's yeah. way like more woods and grass yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And there's one of the roads, streets. Uh, I was just looking at my Twitter, and it was all positive, and I just went. And a rocky. Yeah. Like 10 seconds of just like. Yeah. Then you got to walk. <laughs> yeah. Then you got to get to where you got to look at them. There's just I, life I, makes you. You say you don't like parties, but I think the next time you do one of those, we should endeavor the people that you're close to in life because you're close to a lot of people. I mean, I, I'm aware of this. You're very close to a lot of people. And you're very good at introducing people, mm -hmm. but you don't often bring us all together. Mm. Well, it's, it's very much a, a Avengers assemble with your friends. Mm -hmm. Like we're not all in the same thing. And, uh, but I wonder, should you try and do that with us? Next time, should you maybe try and share yes, that moment? But because I guess the the idea is, I'm not going to be able to do this. I think it would be great fun if you did. Okay, I, like even in a do non it, in, in a non jokey way, I think it'd be great. I to teared kind of, up telling you that, but you, like you, I, it means a lot to me. But it, you came from you came to comedy late. You already I established, came to stand up late. Yeah, comedy early. Knew what you wanted to do. Uh, you know directed one of the seminal shows of the last 20 and years wrote, and, wrote. and wrote yeah and and came to comedy late and then it, you know this is the third netflix special so in terms of appreciation I mean, it's like you did it yeah i well that's the thing is i know here's part of it is i know that yeah i know what i the the journey um mm. but i think most people most other people don't. They're just like, well, I've done nine, <laughs> like, or whatever. The people that Most would be at the party, people, yeah. But yeah, you know, I, I yes. understand. I, I would. Here's what I would say: We all have to do it. Yes, I think so. And, and if you haven't day, done an Netflix special, you, know, you literally have to face the wall. You know, how the greatest watch. line on this. Uh, Noel Gallagher had a great line on this. What was? Well, he was talking about who's the the biggest band or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, someone I don't know who who it was came after them that sold way more records yeah. and did way better. And he went, yeah, but we mean more to people. He's right. And that thing of you go, yeah, that's the. I don't. I now I would say like the, the, I don't mean more to people the, than. I'll, I would say I don't mean more to people than most of the people that would be at the party. Well, okay, but the the you would say that that's uh, maybe. Uh, I think it's also that thing if you go, what's the what's the hidden metric of comedy? Because there's one metric is. Netflix specials, one is ticket sales, mm -hmm. and they're very easy to measure. Yeah. So we, we tend to go to the things that we can measure. But actually, the the metric should be the the joy that people walk out of a show with or what stays with people. Like, 
I suppose songs do it very nicely because sometimes you you hear a song and it stays with you. It's in your head. It's an earworm. It's it's there. It changes the way you think about that thing forever. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes if I write a great joke, it stays with people and they kind of remember yeah. that for you, and it becomes something that they you know quote and it becomes their their thing. Or sometimes a sticky phrase. And yeah. I sometimes think ideas in your show they last a long time in people's minds. It's really yeah. It, like, I, it's, I mean, it's I a think hidden the metric champ of, of that is Chris Rock from Bring the Pain. I think yes, uh, twenty five years old. Absolutely, it's all, it's all, all current. Up. It was he could have had a uh, a portable Chris Rock of just aphorisms and smart yeah. shit he said. He's an aphorism machine. Yeah, Incredible. and uh, um, yeah. but yeah, I don't. I would. I would argue that I'm one of the most inspired. That would be my thing. I would think I have the an actual shot at is like I I can I work hard and I have a fertile mind mm. and. Um, it's just a hard thing to be like, because you can't prove it. So you're like, I think I'm pretty, <laughs> I think I'm, I have a lot of ideas that I like, and I give them to people or I keep them for me or whatever. So that yeah. would be a thing I would think I would have. Like, well, it is, uh, it's I an could, unusual thing. I often will write something that based on an interesting idea and then I'll turn it into a piece of stand up, and I'm not as comfortable with stand up as I am with jokes. Like I'm always, uh -huh. I'm always very impressed with your ability to get an idea to land in a show. Mm. It's quite an unusual skill. So, well, this is a philosophical idea and I'll get this to land. So there's a million different types of sexuality. There's only one type of relationship. There's like dozens of new gender and sexual orientations. There's still only one relationship orientation toward marriage. People go, what about polyamory? There's no tax cuts for polyamory. Stop it. <laughs> and you land it. Yeah. There's a really interesting idea and you, you, kind of, you land it, you make it fun. And it's, it's kind of... You, and kind of as an audience member, go, oh yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. I don't walk around knowing I wrote that. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like I don't, and that is a thing that, it's all, my whole goal, which I've said to you, is most of my goals now are emotional, right? right. It's not like, and then I gotta do, I gotta, it's just, no, I wanna, I wanna do whatever and feel great. Yeah. And so that's, that's a very hard thing to, to, to get to, because it's so, you know, there's not, you can't really watch, YouTube videos about it. I have to have a mind shift, you know? Well, it's that thing of you, you also go the, the, the journey is the fun, like putting this, putting the special together is the fun. And then it's done. You kind of go, okay, well, I'm doing another one. Mm -hmm. I'm writing another thing. I'm going to do something else. Yeah. And um, you have to have ideas for that. So that's where I'm lucky in that, like I can generate a good amount of material. Yeah. Well, let's do another block. Um, you worry about love ending. Yeah. The, I once said about my girlfriend, if she broke up with me, I would be heartbroken and relieved. And I told her that I said it. It's like kind of one of those things. And we've also had a few moments where it was like, I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it. And then we, she's like, oh, I agree. You know, or she thinks it's funny or whatever. I say that because I'm getting the point where uh, so, so uh, society-wise, like uh, a little old to be single and dating, right? It like, and so if if I if she breaks up with me, I feel reject. I'm a I'm a loser, but I'm not an asshole. If I break up with her, I'm an asshole and a little old to be single. I'm worried about committing to. A person and then I just wake up and it's gone. It's like when people talk about being broken up with or fall, being in love and then the person. I was like, have you ever fallen out of love with somebody? Because it's terrifying. Because it's like you go, we got to, you, you guys share a car or let's say it's your car that she goes in and then you, you guys go to the car and it's gone. You, when you aren't in love with somebody, it's terrifying. You feel awful. You you're, so I'm worried about that as like with but is heading into a relationship the, is with somebody. The, you know, Esther Perel is maybe the best writer on this. The the, the two, you know, mating in captivity and the strange state of affairs, uh, the state of affairs rather. Um, and she talks about like she's been in love three times in her life, always with the same guy. Mm. The, the idea that it will consistently be the same all the way through a relationship, I think is like a. a you it's know, the, a Western delusion. The reason, delusion, the reason yeah. romance movies end with a kiss and when they get together, and they never start with a kiss and they're together. Is it's ups and downs. Yeah, it's, uh, lots of ups and downs. So yeah, you might feel like that one day, and the car will be back the next day. 
Maybe. Yeah. It's, so it's, I, but it's a worry because I'm committing to, a, to someone and I'm like, course. I don't want to disappoint her. I, you know, I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to, you know what I mean? I don't want to be unreliable. I want to be the kind of person I want other people to be. Other people. Yeah. Well, you want to correct all the mistakes that were made. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about where you're at now in terms of going, it feels like with the childhood that you had and where you've got to in your career and where you are in life now, you're sort of willing to take something else on. It feels like it's, it feels like there's a real liminal, liminal change, like a big yeah. shift. Yeah. It's, it's phases of where you're, what phases and what your priorities become and what your uh, kind of perception of stuff. How big a shift was the ayahuasca? Jimmy, I thought you'd never ask. Yeah. This is, by the way, the longest <laughs> the show has ever gone. It's the longest I've without... ever gone in conversation without bringing it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's made me, it shifted my priorities. Where I do actually say, as much as I'm joking about like, I don't want to feel like I'm not a big deal. But Well, you want to feel like you're the biggest deal. In one sense, you want to go, I'm at one with the universe. That's, that's, you couldn't be a bigger deal. I'm a tiny cog in the wheel. It's, it's, it, it's, takes it, you to, a it takes you way closer to tiny cog in the wheel. Because you just go like, this is going on in a million places right now. Some, I, I couldn't even, it's like, I feel like once you experience God, you, which I believe I did on ayahuasca and the various things I've done, it just contextualizes you. But I mean, this is, it's amazing to have a list of your, um, your blocks and not to have depression on there. It is such an extraordinary moment. I think it might be worthy of one of those. Yeah. You were depressed for 25 years, uh, medicated um, pretty heavily. Yeah. And well, just one, I guess two things at one point, but yeah, but, yeah. It, but constantly throughout yeah. that period. I don't feel much pride over it because but, I don't, you, I don't think people that have depression are, I never felt bad about it. My family, brother, older brothers be like, are you going to keep taking that stuff? And I was like, yeah, I don't care. It's like diabetes or whatever. Yeah. It's not. So, but the fact you're out the other side of it, I do think is remarkable. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's very few Oscar. people that have. Yeah. Be through, obviously, I see it more as I didn't really earn it. I suffered from it. I mean, when but, you look at, sorry, you, yeah. I tell you what you should watch Blocks. <laughs> it's a Netflix special where a guy at the end talks about all of the different things he did to get through his, he yeah. didn't sit with his depression. Like, it's, it's a weird thing where you're a guy with depression with quite high agency and resource. I, I want, so you read I bought it. everything yeah. and you went and got these crazy magnets on your head in, but they weren't strong enough so you went to China to get stronger, more illegal ones. Um, we don't care about this guy. Fucking turn it up to 11. But that thing of like going, you really looked for everything and you found something that worked for you and a non-addictive drug, you know, you get the call, you hang up the phone or you, you have the message from it and it feels like you're exactly the same person I've always known. There's an absolute essence yeah. of neil brennan but now you're you're not depressed anymore. I have some, and how i can hit the gas a little on i couldn't hit the gas when i was depressed you there was yeah. no ability to hit the gas uh energetically yeah and now there's some i still have i can hit the gas problem is my face doesn't always do it <laughs> Yeah. My face just sometimes just like, I think I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm kind of beaming. amused by how little, you, you know, how much there's a, there's a, there's a shot Neil has on his phone, his screensaver, which is the, it's him on stage and it's the monitor, which would normally have prompts or something on it if you're recording a special. And it just says smile. Yeah. And it's so and funny to me. I still didn't smile enough. Yeah. I go, I, I But the linked. irony of your job being, I mean, it's like the, it's the classic old joke about the clown. Yeah. Going to see the psychiatrist. And the guy says, well, you're depressed. You go and see Pavel. Pavel's playing this weekend. He's the greatest clown in the world. He's, you go and have a good laugh. That'll cure it. He goes, I am Pavel. <laughs> That's funny. But the yeah. thing, you're on stage making people laugh, making people feel okay about what they're going through because really your sharing is, is you know, it's hard to watch one of your shows and not project a little. What do you mean? Well, because you watch it and you talk about, you're very emotionally honest mm -hmm. and it's hard to watch it and not go, oh yeah, I've got a thing with, it's not that, but it's this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever that, that thing is. Yeah. I, I, as you're saying this, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I see that as I, I was so self-pitying for so long that now that I'm not, I don't, uh, I don't even understand it. So if you feel like I don't give my childhood enough well, no, power I, I, or not power, but just no, but acknowledgement. 
But yeah, I it, don't. I with the ayahuasca and the depression thing, like I had time and I had a little money, so I could do stuff hmm. that most people can't. Well, it's so also I was, that thing of like, what has your fairness came from your a a fucking awful childhood? Mm -hmm. You got this incredible ability for fairness, like this. This you're obsessed by fairness. I would say most of your stand up comedy is a dissection of the world that looks for mm -hmm. fairness. Yeah. And you look for things being, well, that's off. That's wrong. A buddy of mine this said, I'm like a Southern fair. lawyer where I'm like, your honor. <laughs> yeah. One more thing. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. That thing that everyone else is doing in the world, I don't like it. And you're willing to be unpopular for sure. that. So that that feels that's quite um, a super, like you talk about lack of appreciation, but it's, my friend said this thing to me recently that was really, um, he's a really famous singer in, in uh, the rest of the world, Robbie Williams. Mm -hmm. And he's got a Netflix special. Yeah, so no, get, it's you know, great. Netflix uh, yeah. thing. We said, I'm an entertainer in the classic sense. If you don't love me, I don't love me. Right. And I think comedians, all comedians, but maybe you more than anyone, are you desperately want to be loved, but entirely on your own terms. Willing to do nothing to get it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, well I'm willing to speak. You're willing to, you're willing to speak to people, you're willing to yeah, put yeah. on a show and be super funny. Yeah. But like, if they don't like it, it's like, uh. Okay. But no, no, but you you underestimate to me. You underestimate my sensitivity. Where I'm like, I do the one person wasn't smiling. I do the bad Instagram message. Did I ever tell you the uh, the smiling story from Montreal for me? Mm -mm. That like I did a Montreal show. This was many many years ago with uh, it's been quite a small room. Uh, I remember Galifianakis was on before me. Just amazing. So I did the show. Did like an hour and couldn't have gone any better. And there's one guy in the front row looking at me like, like. Like, like I'd killed his dog, like stink eye the whole time. Well, how, what more do I have to do? Don't come yeah. to the show. Definitely don't sit in the front. You're just going to fucking yeah. look at me. And just nothing, not one laugh. And I'm walking out of the theater and he's waiting in the lobby. And I went up to him and I went, and he went, I'm from uh, uh, yeah. uh, Venezuela, but I, English is my fourth language. You're my favorite comedian. I have to concentrate so hard. And you go, okay, all bets are off. Yeah. All bets are off. We had a similar one where there was a comedian that we were on shows with where I was like, does that guy hate me? And you were like, you were on stage and he was miming your act with you. I won't say who because it's not important, but you know who I'm talking about. Uh, and it's like, yeah, you. we often misinterpret yes. the people's perception of us. Sometimes we don't though. And so that's where I I I'm open to the thought that maybe they they uh, there's some sort of misunderstanding in my perception of their behavior, but there are times where people just don't like me. Well, I, so. I think you're going to have a spider sense for that forever. That's just that's locked in. You can't have that. We talk about factory settings, and I talk about this a lot now with with my kids. Like the first thousand days being the factory settings, how they are, what they do, how they interact with the world. You want to give you want to give the therapist the least to do in the future, mm -hmm. and you go. Well, you couldn't give a therapist more to work with in terms of trauma and childhood. Yeah, in, ter in terms of that stuff, and you seem kind of through it now, which is kind of amazing. That's I mean, also ayahuasca, where yeah. I just became. You know, I mean, my like, I spent time with my mom a few days ago in Philly, and I was. You know, it's it, at that age. It's how many times? How many more times am I going to hang out with my mom? There's a terrifying fact I read recently about you spend with your kids 98% of the time with your kids up until the age of 18. Yeah. And then it's like you're you're begging them to come for lunch. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you money. C come collect the check. And now, yeah, now with my mom, I'm just kind of over all the grievances and I can enjoy her more. Yeah. I always thought that was the best bit of wisdom. Someone just threw it away. Chatting to someone and they, you know, about parents and whatever. And they just, they went, accept the apology you're never going to get. And move on. Yeah, I thought, oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty coming. good. Just take a moment, just to go. Okay, well, what would it be like if they did? Then... I, it was honestly, it's this is a pretty damning thing to say, but it's the first time in my life where I'm when my mom dies, I'm going to miss her, and I wasn't aware of it before. I may not have experienced it before, and I'm going to miss it. Like I will miss having her. Why you just got close enough? Right I, at the it, end. she's done nothing. I've just processed enough stuff where I, it also just feels kind of silly and useless to be like, so where were you in 1978? Yeah. <laughs> feels like an investigation. So she doesn't remember. 
I barely remember. So yes. why am I still? Why do I still have her under the lights? With the, and I throw a cigarette and I'm like, so tell me about my child. <laughs> tell me about your behavior from so fucking long ago that I can ruin my it's life being th consumed with it. But as a fairness act, act, uh, aficionado, yeah, detective, um, it is also what made you who you are. You're a very unusual guy. There's, I don't know anyone else like you. There's no one else in that bracket. I agree, and I felt sorry for myself about it. I mean, that blocks is kind of a version of that. Is like, can you believe? Yeah. I, don't, I don't have a tribe. I don't have a good family. I don't have a. I can't get a good relationship going. I think a lot of people feel like that in the in the modern world. The things that you touch on there, where you go, well, I'm I'm uh, how liberal are you? Which is one of my favorite mm -hmm. set pieces in there. How liberal are you? Like ah! you go, yeah, you 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 know, you kind of join or ally yourself with a political party, and then they shift over twenty years, and you go, well, what happened there? I I, I was yeah. It, you know, things change. You go, well, I don't, uh, what was your line? I don't believe, I don't agree with anyone about everything. There was the Mark Twain thing. And it was like during one of Dave's trans episodes and everyone in the press line was asking us like, so what do you make of the trans? And I go, I don't agree with them. It's fine. I don't, and I don't agree with any single person about everything. It's just not, but it's lonely it, writ large, it's lonely as as like the blocks all the all my beliefs sort of conflicting with people or conflicting with norms. I've stopped. Uh, something happened. I probably ayahuasca, but I don't. I'm not very aware of. It's not something I think about. It. I've just been like, look, man, this is who you are. There's trade offs, and let's try yeah. to have fun. Like literally, smile as much as you. I have smile flashing behind you right now. Uh, no, it, it like you, I, I can't harp on it. I was just harping. I was constantly harping. I, I will say I still harp on some of the grudges because I can't believe them. But, and I, and I just, I came to something a few days ago where I was like, this is not fun. It's just not, it, my brain wants to do it. And I've had to stop. I've just gotten away from it as much as possible. I've just go like, no, stop. No, stop. 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 Like the first thought comes up. And I'm like, stop. Just, uh. Yeah. This show was sponsored by BetterHelp. Not surprised. Look, you know, kind of all we talk about is therapy. It's one of my things. In fact, I'm dating one. Anyhow, therapy has made me the man you sit before you. Only the good parts. A uh, common misconception about therapy as it pertains to uh relationships is that they have to be easy or right but sometimes the best ones happen when both people put in the work to make them great i happen to be dating a therapist and i've gone to a lot of therapy so we can have discussions about therapy or use tools we use that we learn from therapy you don't have to date a therapist just go to better help you don't have to don't date your therapist she's not my therapist i don't need to explain myself to you therapy can be a place to work through the challenges you face in all of your relationships whether with friends, work, your significant other, or anyone. What I got from therapy most of, of all was probably tuning into how I actually felt about things and developing boundaries that were healthy, where I would say things, what was okay, what was not okay. Just little, those are micro things. They're not, they don't sound big, but if you don't do them, they can make your life total misery total misery. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit betterhelp.com slash N-E-A-L today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. B E T T E R H E L P dot com slash N E A L. Therapy is great. It will help you give birth to yourself. Be your own doula. Better help. You know, at some point in our illustrious love lives, we've all asked our partner the same age old question that guys have probably been asking for thousands of years Am I big? While MeUndies doesn't know the actual answer to that, or if your partner gave you the actual truth, but this Valentine's Day, they can help you look huge with their contoured pouch and ball caddy i used to be a golf caddy so i this this is near and dear to me 
Every Valentine's Day needs a Valentine's night, and me undies is your perfect thirst trap to get the mood right. Oh, all right. So they sent me this the other day. Uh, they sent me one pair three days ago, and I I'm such a dirtbag that I just immediately wore it the next day. I didn't like. I'll put it in the pile. It's like no, that you're going right in the rotation because all the we need all the new underwear we can get. And I liked it. It's good. The ball caddy thing is a new idea. Maybe with like old tidy whities there used to be. There was a bit of a ball. There was no room for it. It was like they would build it for it, but it was like two dimensional. There was no. They wouldn't give you extra depth in the ball area. And now they do. They. I. I'm. I was wearing it yesterday. Not wearing them now. Sorry. But it was me undies. They're great. So they got style for everyone. From all black classics to fun, expressive prints, MeUndies has a look for everyone. Try our sexy new V-Day prints like Electric Hearts or Lovebirds. Plus, they come in sizes extra small to 4XL, guaranteeing a flattering cut for everybody. But it doesn't end there. MeUndies isn't just about underwear. Explore the lounge collection, guys. Featuring joggers, hoodies, onesies, and more. It's breathable. Stretchy and oh so comfy, making it ideal for all day wear. And they use sustainably sourced materials and work with partners that care for their workers and they care about their customers also because if you're not happy with your first pair of me undies, it's on me undies. Here's the deal this Valentine's Day, good things come in big packages at me undies. Get 20% off your first order plus free shipping at meundies.com slash N E A L. That's M-E-U-N-D-I-E-S dot com slash N-E-A-L for 20% off plus free shipping. Legitimately good deal. Me undies. Comfort from the outside in. You guys missed a heck of a hand gesture if you're listening to this. The ayahuasca thing, like I had such a strong God experience the other night on ayahuasca and I was like, I got to align more with this. It was so overpowering, just like the idea of like lo God's love. And it's like, God's, what are you even talking? It's my experience with the God thing was so strong that it's like, yeah, yeah, yes. I, yeah, this is God being like, yeah, but I gotta, like, what do you want? I don't even know. I barely know what you're talking about. I'm so massive. So whatever. Can you let go of those grudges now then? Can you, I can, I don't know whether it's, if you want to repair any relationships or if you want to reach out to people you've fallen out with. But it strikes me that that's at some stage when you, when you can't remember what the fight was about, you. It's a lot of it is like having stand it's self regard. Yeah. I mean, I, feel, I don't I, want to be friends with somebody who doesn't hold me in the same esteem as I hold them. I, I just don't. It, and, but, it, but it's, it's right sizing the grievance. I, 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 fallen out with very few people over the years. I fell out with one guy that uh, I had a, a crisis and he put the boot in. He, you know, uh, getting canceled and uh, you, you go, well, hang on. That's, if you if you can't be there for me when the bad when I need stuff is be, happening, yeah. I don't need you at a party. Yeah. So, thanks. If I, oh, and I, I support you and it's a, it's a one-way street, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's... I'll call that. And you go, well, there's a, there's a pettiness to that, I suppose. I could forgive but you go, well, okay. And then what? Yeah. And like, then you're, you've forgiven someone like who you know is not going to be there. I feel like I've devalued every friendship if I do that. I feel like- Absolutely I, correct. You can be, I don't have any standards. You can yeah. treat me any kind of way. It, it speaks to someone who has incredibly shallow relationships. Like, yeah, I don't care if you, it's like, dude, what do you, I'm not looking for, I'm looking for dependability. I'm hoping that it's about low level shit. I, you know what I mean? Uh, but you kind of have to prepare for like something bad might happen to me. And I also have the fantasy of I'm on my deathbed and they all come back. <laughs> so is that the fantasy? Is that the. Yeah. And then my new standard is like, I'll give you 15 minutes. Like, again, it's all just I was. It's interesting. Though. Go on. What's the poorly treated as a child and. And uh, and I've learned boundaries. And I think. I was friends with people for a reason. And then once you find out that they don't have you in the same regard, I think it's over. Cause, cause again, what do, what's the point? It's like, forgive someone. So, okay, then what are we? Then, uh, then they're a person I know who I cannot count on. Doesn't seem like, right. 
but I have a, a you know a hallmark thing of like so and so's here to see you, and I'm like mm. <laughs> send them in. But it's it. I also know it's silly because they're not changing. Like, nobody's changing. I don't know. I think we've both. You and I changed. I've changed quite a lot in the last five years. I mean, it's actually, really, since we've known each other, mm -hmm. and you've been. I mean, to to give you credit, you've been a huge part of my life in terms of my intellectual growth and mm -hmm. growth as a comedian and aspiration as a comedian. I How think, come? That, I didn't. I never thought about that. Well, when I first saw Three Mics, heard the idea, saw like a bit of it in Montreal. Didn't see the whole thing, but saw a bit of it. And went, this is that feels interesting, and then got. I went, I'm only doing one of those mics. I'm not doing anything from stand up really. So I've learned how to write stand up and I do more stand up now. And, you know, you come on a podcast, you're more emotionally honest, which is sort of the, it's a different medium for the third mic. And it feels like that's a big influence on my life, but also just spending time with you. It's kind of, it's pushed me in another direction where you kind of go, well, actually, what do you rate in comedy? I'm not really interested in the, in the metrics that most people look at. I'm interested in what's a, what's a great show that stays with people, what's a good special, right. how do you craft that, how does it look, how does it think? You've been a huge influence Thank on, you. on me. I, I regard you as um, a peer, but I also regard you as one of the goats. I, I really do. I, I really feel like your specials, I often cite, you, you often get asked what's, what's the best special. Yeah, yeah. The three mics and blocks, I think, are really great specials. They're in, they're in the pantheon. Thank you. Thank there's, you. There's nothing better than that out there. It's a, the proper shows. Yeah, and then I go, but I'm not even the fortieth most popular comedian. Like, you know what I mean? That I can, I can discount it because a lot of life, a lot of my life is. I'm like, I'm. Am I? Am I feel like I'm good. I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm. How I'm trying, <laughs> trying to make it better. I'm trying to ex explain, uh, explore. But it's then, also comedically. I mean, not just as an individual, as a as a man, as a as a comic. Like, can you imagine a certain? There's quite a lot of. Uh, if we went to the comedy store tonight, there's quite a lot of people that you wouldn't put up against. You, oh, don't put him up because he's just been up. She's just been up. So maybe let's leave a, bl a, a gap between the next because there's a similar flavor. Right. You're on your own. Yeah. No one else is doing that. No, well, I don't do it at the comedy store, but I know what you mean. Like, yeah, I agree with. Here's one of the problems is I kind of agree with you where I'm like, I feel like I'm good. Mm. And. Uh, but my popularity isn't commensurate with other people. So I go, I guess, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not. So, But what's the, uh, but the popularity thing, I just think is the, it's the wrong metric to look at. I, the, I know, but it's still a the, really, I think it's but the it's, one. It's only because it's measurable. It's so easy I to know. measure how many shows, how many tickets, how many things. I agree. Does that mean you're a better comic than someone else? No, it, it yeah. doesn't. It's also, there's a test of time. I'm pretty sure in no year over the last 50 years, George Carlin was the biggest comedian. I don't think he was the biggest comedian even when he had his big years. He that I don't two know. Or three. I, I don't think he ever had maybe one He or two may have been. Years. He may have been for a long time. But let the, let the record show yeah. as things go forward. Lots of people that were popular at the time kind of fall away. I think with popularity, I, A, I think it's kind of, but who cares? Shallow like, in a weird way. But the but, legacy thing, I think, is nonsense because you go, of course, well, you're never going to enjoy whatever, it. Yeah. But you've always got an eye on that. I, I, I think it's more just like, am I respected and uh, uh, people are glad I'm around? I think that's more. And like, do I feel like I'm doing a good job? So, um, so I do think about that, but then it's no one. The, the thing with popularity is everyone just it becomes a cultural thing of like everyone standing behind like i remember somebody saying like yes yeah, shane gillis is going to be the new louis and i was like how did you decide that <laughs> like it just seems like there's a cultural wave and they go like he's got he's round stomached like louis so he's going to be the next louis and you're like and he's great and all that other. but it so i don't think i'll ever get that i and then i go why I, don't i, I, I get I don't know. that it strikes me that you're being kinder to yourself in a personal uh, arena and you, you've not quite got there in a professional arena yet to be kinder to yourself to take a moment and look around and acknowledge i agree and also being happy where you are the acceptance of going well if this is it if it all ends tomorrow my god what a run you've had you'd you'd never Great. want to roll those dice again you know, yeah this is this is a fantastic life i know it's hard it's hard to contextualize yourself within comedy and then 
within all lives ever lived. I mean, Meaning, within all lives ever lived, we are so far ahead of the pack. I it's totally agree. But then you go, am I? Or because I've had like mental illness stuff and bad childhood, and so I don't. I. I. It's hard. It's all like shifting context and. Yeah, the mental health stuff. I don't think is. And I think we've mentioned it, but we haven't made a bit like depression for twenty five years that you got through. That's like hearing someone had stage four bowel cancer. Yeah. And they're fine now. Yeah. Oh no, it's gone. It's yeah. been gone for five years. They're over it. That's like you have because depression is one of the the biggest killers in the nation, and it's people see suicide as a separate thing. It it is a symptom of um, depression. And you've been through it like like a proper dark times, mm -hmm. and you've come through it. You, I mean, it's extraordinary. Yeah. No, I agree. How do I feel? <laughs> Huh? That's what I said. My life is amazing if I could just experience it for one minute. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that'll be about letting someone else in. And uh, I think you'll, you, you know, that's going to be about someone else. That won't be about. That's you, interesting. You, I, because I don't think I agree with that. I think, I, think I have to get there on my own. There's an illusion in life that we're individuals. There's no such thing as a baby. The, the baby on its own, dead in 12 hours, is nothing, nothing without other people. Nothing without a, a baby and a mother is a thing. Baby and a father, baby and an auntie, baby and in, in in a stranger. Fine. But a baby on its own isn't anything. And we're all babies. We all think we're individuals. And we're all so interconnected. And it so matters. And it feels like that you're a little bit isolated, but you're letting people in. And there, and there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a growth in that. And you're becoming more connected to the world. Yeah. I, I, and, I, and I could see why you'd be isolated. I could see why... There's a self-preservation. There's a protection there. You're worried about. I mean, the, yeah. The, the most lot... of the problems were because of people I let in. I was letting the wrong people in, and now I feel like I'm letting better people in. But how would you possibly know the difference between good attention and bad attention when your whole childhood was no attention? It was attention when I was funny, and it was attention. I did get a, the other thing that I have a hard time feeling sorry for myself about is like I was the center. I was funny from early and I was the youngest. So there's just tons of attention. So yeah, there's the parental stuff, but I was so lucky in other ways, you know? Um, and I, I do, I am more cognizant of that as years go on. So, so yeah. So now it's about like, dude, you're not helping these grudges, these swirls of thoughts and, are just, they're not helpful. You just yeah. got to stop it. I found that CBT stuff to be the cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy. Even if you're not going to go, if you just read the, the list, pattern, the list yeah. of thought patterns, you just Google CBT thought patterns and you go, oh my God, do that, do that, do that. And actually just knowing sometimes that that's what you're doing yeah. is enough. You kind of go, oh, I'm doing one of those. Mm -hmm. I'm magical thinking. That's just magical mm -hmm. thinking. That, yeah. Because that, then that, or the, you know, the counterfactual thing, oh, on my deathbed, they'll come in and I'll, this is just an imagined, this isn't anything. This isn't real. What's real is is now. And I think the these friendships and these grudges matter a lot because the other thing isn't there. But when the other thing comes, the other- I think now I'm in a phase where, or I have been, where it's just like everyone out and now I'm slowly meeting people and letting them in, but like sort of, having a better because i had a ton of magical thinking about friendships and people and what it was going to be and we're gonna we're all gonna live in bunk beds and we're gonna be mm. fucking and then recently i've been more like cautious about like can you have a friendship yeah <laughs> can you do this i think you can okay let's try it you know well comics become very good at getting on with people that they're you know from starting in the clubs you're with people you might see them every day for five days and hang on a bus and go on trains and planes or whatever. And then you don't see them for two years. Yeah. And I feel like the difference between acquaintances and friends, like if you're doing small talk, it's just an acquaintance. And if you get right back in where you left off. You yes. Know, great. Yeah. So like I'm having better habits with that. And the things I need were better friendship habits and better mental habits in terms of what am I thinking about? Because the thing with the grudges is I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, you never write jokes from this. I get no bits. It's just a, it's a spin cycle. Yeah. And then, so it's like, Neil, stop and write a bit. Just stop and go write a bit. Yeah. Like, a, I, I do think that thing of like the, the, you know, when comics ask for advice, there's a great thing on uh, the website, Strange Loop, not doing the thing. You ever seen that? Mm-mm. 
just about comedians. What they're, what they're. It's not about comedians. Do you want to hear it? It's pretty good. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah, not. Okay, so strange loop are the. Uh, I don't know who they, these guys are. Preparing to do the thing isn't doing the thing. Scheduling time to do the thing isn't doing the thing. Making a to-do list for the thing isn't doing the thing. Telling people you're going to do the thing isn't doing the thing. Messaging friends who may or may not be doing the thing isn't doing the thing. Writing a banger tweet about how you're going to do the thing isn't doing the thing. Hating on yourself for not doing the thing isn't doing the thing. Hating on other people who have done the thing isn't doing the thing. Hating on the obstacles in the way of doing the thing isn't doing the thing. Fantasizing about all of the adoration you'll receive once you do the thing isn't doing the thing. Reading about how to do the thing isn't doing the thing. Reading about how other people did the thing isn't doing the thing. Reading this essay isn't doing the thing. The only thing that's doing the thing is doing the thing. Yeah. I I, and I have a good work ethic. Yeah, and no, I still were like, yep. I, I read that and I was like, yep, that's uh, totally true. And it seems like most people spend their 20s doing that their entire 20s mm. and then half of their 30s and then by the time they're in their 40s the, they no one wants has any uh interest in them doing the thing it's like yeah. you just kind of can't getting the other stuff out of the way and i think i i think that stoic thing uh i got a lot from talking to chris williamson this year actually the modern wisdom podcast the, the i mean which is where that's from um the that thing of like going do less better do less better do fewer things in a better way yeah do yeah. fewer things in a better way be a stand up, just do that. And I think emotionally going, well, your friendship group is uh, spread out across the world and lots of different people. I think just focusing in, you give, I think you, you have a, a load to give. I think it's, it feels very exciting. It feels like there's a new, there's the third act here. Right. I, I, I am curious about what that is. Uh, we also talked about death, the thing of, I'm the youngest of 10. Yeah. I'm probably going to have to bury statistically i supposed to I bury nine and i think it is i think you may want to invest in a mass grave it's a lot it's a lot of people to go it really is yeah really, right. how many graves does do i leave it open until the next person do I, until they crazy all die to close it what are you what are you talking about there's yeah yeah i think you're right and then, well, you don't even close it someone else you just go there you just leave a note all right, saying, that's everybody throw me in and then <laughs> and that's the brennan yeah when i start to feel very tired i head toward Yes. The grave. Um, yes, you're going to have to bury a lot of people. And I'm also hands. worried about death. It's a weird thing. Are your siblings still alive? Yeah. Because what, what's the age gap? Who's the oldest? Joe. He's 66. Wow, okay. Yeah. So so I, I worry about death in... Uh, I don't want to die for my girlfriend. Like, I'm, I'm really interested in, like, being with her. And spending yeah. as much time with her as I can before I die. And yeah, I often have that thing like, you know, before, you know, when there's turbulence on a plane mm -hmm. and you think you're going down, mm -hmm. what do you think? I just hope the cookie gets there before, before the plane crashes. I used to have a thing where I went, <laughs> whenever there was turbulence, I would always think I had a pretty good run. I had a really good run. Uh, no one had Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And now I go, oh no, there's a fear now. Because of your before. wife and child, yeah, children. Yeah, because you got, you got babies. Yeah. And you go, oh, oh I can't yeah. miss that. I yeah. can't miss that. It's the, it's the greatest show on earth. Yeah, no, but I, I have received some mess weird messages about like, you're going to die soon. And one of them was on MDMA. I was like, what are you fucking talking about? Like, wh And they were like, no, it's fine, 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 fine. And then a few people lately have had dreams about me dying. So I'm like, I'm worried. Well, now, I think the biggest... This, this feels like this is the bit of the podcast that we're going to... We're going to have to dig out on that day. <laughs> no, I'm giving you footage for the documentary. Okay. If they, I think I'd get at least like a YouTube documentary. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm going theatrical. Uh, but now I think but about, I mean, that I couldn't think, be more magical thinking. If we were trying to define magical thinking, that would be it. That I'm not going to die? There's nothing the matter with you. You're fine. I know. Do you know what? It might be good to mark it as a thing of like, go into a health check, go and do something positive that you can un you can go i finish with that thought because i think that's going to whir around for a while so if i were you were going to see it go and get a medical no i thought i had skin cancer and it was psoriasis so like and the rest of my levels are great so i i don't know and then to two people who said they had a dream about me dying there were different ways so i'm like all right this is i think this is hogwash sorry so you think dr dreams aren't real because they're not consistent okay <laughs> no. i mean also if if two people have a dream and you die in exactly the same way that's just a coincidence don't worry about that right no, that's what I like when I figured out when my sister told me how I died. I was like, 
All right. Well, that's totally different than the other one. So yeah, I, I, you know what? Maybe we should do a public service announcement. If you have a dream about anyone dying, maybe just eat just, it. Yeah, sit on that. it. Just yeah. you don't need to share that. Yeah, certainly not with a person that you think is going to die. Because what are you? I know a Native I've... American wise man. I mean, yeah. I guess if you are, then share it. They probably know something. Yeah. Yes. People don't know how to discern what's like you know spiritual and what's just random. But even yeah. the thing where but I think also taking death as a, you know, let, let's be hippies for a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. I said earlier I, I, on a different podcast, I think I don't believe in an afterlife, but I, I believe in a next life. Mm -hmm. And I think the old Neil is gone. I think you were depressed for 25 years. You were a different kind of guy. And now there's a new you. There's a new phase, the third act, whatever we're calling it. Mm -hmm. So that's a type of death and rebirth. As, there, as yeah. there always is in life. You know, you, you kind of put that behind you and go, well, this is the new thing. Yeah. I'd also just written a will. Well, that will do it for you because that's yeah. such a depressing yeah. conversation of like, where does everything go? Yeah. Well, why can't I keep on, keep it? Yeah. Because you're dead. And you're like, bury it with me in, in a pyramid. In, yeah. Yes. Play, or in the pit. Yeah. Um, in the pit with the other brothers. Yes. Uh, so I, that's made me philosophical lately and, and, uh, but I think the things that I would like to accomplish is more consistent joy, some sort of emotional resolution. I want some resolution with some of the, my issues and, and I would like to spend as much time with my lady as possible. Like that's what the, that's, those are my two goals. They're not, they're very not professional. Yeah, I, it feels very achievable. I think the, I think you have to give yourself a, yeah, on the, through to the depression and out the other side, and in terms of like closure, it's not going to get any better than that. Right, and I, I will agree that I, I know I've had an amazing life. I absolutely know that my life up to this point has been fucking incredible. Yeah, and some sense of that would be good, and I think. But you, I, do ha you do have a sense of that in that intellectually you, you can acknowledge that, you know that, and you go, you're, so, you, you're thinking, I will feel a different way. I think that's an illusion mm. that you think, you're, you think you'll get to the top of the mountain or you'll buy the house or buy the car or get the watch. Whatever the thing is that signifies success, that you go, I, I don't feel any different. It's the, the, the dopamine thing of going, I need, I need the thing, I need the thing, and then you get the thing and it doesn't feel any different. Yeah, I, you're probably right, but every once in a while you get something that does feel different. Every yeah. once in a while you're overcome with this. I think a little bit of the success in our business goes a long way. A little, a little, you know, once you get the first, I don't know, whatever the thing was for you, the Netflix special, mm -hmm. kind of look around, you got the house, you go, okay, we're doing, we're doing fine. Yeah. But acknowledging that on a daily basis, the gratitude, all you've got to do is practice gratitude. From my point of view, like to, to, to make good on that first ambition, to have closure, is just practicing gratitude. And, and you do, but it's like, just more, just more consistent. More. Yeah, not more. Yeah, but just more of that. More, more gratitude yeah. before you go to bed. When you wake up in the morning, just great. Yeah, I'm so great. It's I've done things I can't believe. It's unbelievable. So, well, you get back to the lack of appreciation. Yeah, that's on you. You don't even appreciate how good it is. You can't even believe. I don't. You know, did I, it. I, I, I'm un underestimated. I'm underrated in my own head. Yeah, and I experience it from everybody else, and that's why I get so mad about it. But it's like, dude, you gotta. You started it. <laughs> yeah, it's like you, you first. Yeah, like you know, I have. You're right. I have to do it. Uh, it's such a pleasure spending time with you. Every, I, I mean, totally agree. The podcast is is a is a is a fun way to look you in the face for an hour and just yeah. chat about you. And I think you're great. I think Thank there's you. only better things ahead. I think it's you know the your, your kind of your growth and the fact that you share it with people so openly. There, there, there's a generosity to you. That's extraordinary. Thank you. Let's You're leave great. it there. Great yeah. to see you, man. Love. Love you. Said it on the last one. Still mean it. <laughs> Two hours later.